Welcome back to The Prayer Course. This is our second session. My name is Poppy Williams, and I'm here today with my friend, Pete Gregg. So, Pete, last time we really looked at this great request, right, that the disciples had for Jesus. Um, Lord, teach us to pray. And you said that we need to keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up. Yep. And I think the plan today is for us to actually really dive into the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, exactly. Today, uh, we're going to look at that opening line of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus teaches us to address our prayers to our Father in heaven, and then to pray, hallowed be uh, your name. So we're going to be looking at where prayer really begins, which is with worship and adoration. So let's talk about adoration for a second, right? Because I love to worship, but there are definitely times when I'm praying that I find myself kind of delving into the just asking God for stuff on my list kind of prayers. Right. And look, obviously, if you're in an aeroplane and it's about to hit the ground, you don't need to put on a Tim Hughes CD or yes, something exactly. like that. It's really okay just to scream help. <laughs> but when we're talking about developing a disciplined, deepening prayer life, in our own personal quiet times or in church prayer meetings, it's a good idea to start with adoration. It's like um, the, obviously the microscope here, the telescope here. It's easy to spend most of our lives just staring through a microscope, kind of obsessing about ourselves and our own little concerns and how we're feeling and what we're thinking. But there's a really, really big world out there and a very big God who made the cosmos. And I think when we worship, it's a bit like we swap the microscope for the telescope. It, it's, it changes everything. So when, you, when you stare up at the stars at night, anyone who's not completely weird worships. No one, no one stares up at the stars and thinks, aren't I amazing? Right. You get lost <laughs> in something bigger than who you are. And Jesus tells us to start prayer with that attitude, remembering that God is God. That he's holy, that he's our Father in heaven, that he loves us. And not just to kind of like fill our shopping carts with requests and ram them against heaven's gates. That's, that's not really prayer, because this is relational, not transactional. God isn't just some big slot machine in the sky waiting for us to, you know, put in our prayers to get an answer. Yeah. I think it's a, a lot like when our two boys were quite little and I'd just finished writing one of the books. I was exhausted and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. There was a, a, a pub at the time near our house that had two vital ingredients that I'd been thinking about. One was a big leather sofa. I just wanted to zonk out in, in that sofa. And the other was um, swings and slides for the kids. So we arrived there and I said to the boys, you know, go forth, Be behold, free. the Lord has provided. Take as long <laughs> as you want. And I just collapsed into the sofa. And the boys ran towards the door and I saw one of them go out to the door and I could see through the window, he ran towards the swings and the slides. <laughs> uh, but the other one got to the door and he watched his brother and then he looked back and he walked back towards me really slowly. And I thought, well, you know, what does he want? And he looked up at me and he just, these big eyes, he just said this thing to, that, that sucked the air out of the room. He said, Daddy, um, I, I missed you. Oh. and climbed into my arms, put his arms around my neck, and just he just stayed there for a long time, just breathing in time with his dad. And at that moment, he didn't become more my son than the one outside on the swings, right? right? right. Um, and I didn't start to love him more than the other one, but I can't tell you how much his act of unnecessary affection ministered to my weary father's heart. Wow. And I think that maybe is a little bit of a picture of adoration. It's this coming to the Father not to get something from him, but to give our love and our affection to him. It's, it's kind of about being uh, rather than doing. And so this is an understanding that prayer is primarily about intimacy and presence. In fact, the, the Book of Common Prayer that was written in 1662 says, this is a great definition of adoration. It says, adoration is the lifting of the heart and the mind to God, asking nothing but to enjoy God's mm. presence. This is the enjoyable bit of prayer. Prayer is meant to be enjoyable. C.S. Lewis, yes. right, Narnia Chronicles and all of that, um, he said, in commanding us to glorify God 
and we sometimes think, what, you know, what is God an egomaniac? Why does he want us to worship him? He says this, in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us, get this, to enjoy him. Wow. It's enjoyable to look through that telescope and, and contemplate the greatness of the world that God has made. We kind of know this in, in human relationships. I didn't marry Sammy just to create some child raising strategy, you know, on some spreadsheet. Yeah. That wouldn't be a very good relationship. I married her because I was besotted with her, in love with her, wanted to spend the rest of my life with her, wanted to get close to her. And out of that getting close, without going into too many details, these messy miracles we call children were conceived. And that is the biggest blessing of my life. But that, that wasn't the aim. The aim was each other. And so in just the same way, I think when we give ourselves to God in relationship with him through you know, adoration and intimacy, presence, thanksgiving, there are miraculous and messy consequences that we call answers to prayer. But it's really important to say that wasn't the primary aim. The primary aim of prayer is relationship, it's adoration. Yeah. Well, I love all of those analogies, but I guess I'm trying to figure out what does that look like practically. Okay. Well, why don't we look at one of the most amazing prayer times in the, in the Bible, because I think that can help us to okay. look at things practically. So this is Acts chapter 4, and the background to this is that the apostles Peter and John have been hauled up in front of the religious court and, and told to shut up, to stop preaching about Jesus. And it's intimidating, right? Mm. These are important people. Peter and John are just provincial fishermen. They don't know they're in the Bible yet. Right. So what do they do? Well, this is Acts 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, verse 24, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now, I find that interesting because we would tend to have a meeting, make a plan, you know. Right. Form a form, committee. Exactly. <laughs> and, and what they do is instinctively, like it erupts out of them, they all pray all at once together. And, and the, the words of the prayer are recorded for us. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So that was like a really powerful prayer. Yeah, you can say that again. The place is shaken, the gospel takes a big leap forward. And because it's so powerful, I've spent a bit of time studying this. And you know, that prayer that they prayed in uh, English is 137 words long. But only the last 35 words are asking God to actually do anything. If it had been me, I would have started by saying help. Yeah. It's 74% of the prayer is just, it's kind of telling God stuff about himself that he already knows, like sovereign Lord, you made the heavens. Duh. Yeah. And uh, um, you may have noticed that they crucified your son, Jesus. So pop quiz moment. What, why do you think that is? What's going on here? Why do they spend so much time just telling God stuff about himself? Well, I guess they're worshipping. Exactly. It, it's I suppose they're doing, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. They're focusing on the telescope, the bigness of God, mm. before they get into the microscope, right. the immediacy of their own predicament. So it's like they're recontextualizing their own crisis in the bigger narrative of God. There's this painting that hangs in the National Gallery in London by the 16th century Renaissance master, Filippino Lippi. And it depicts Mary, the mother of Jesus, with the baby Jesus on her lap, and these two saints, Jerome and Dominic, kneeling at her feet. 
And the thing with it is, you know, it's by Lippi, so it's a big deal. It's got a big old gold frame, but it's always been seen rather as one of his second-rate paintings. The perspective's a bit weird, and it looks like the mountains behind Mary are going to topple out of the frame. Mm. And then this renowned art critic called Robert Cumming was standing analysing this painting one day in the National Gallery, and he had an epiphany. He suddenly realised it wasn't painted to hang in an art gallery by sort of proud people analysing it. It was painted as an altarpiece. Oh. And so very self-consciously, the proud art critic knelt down on the marble floor in front of this second-rate painting, very aware of you know, everyone around him. But he said, as he did so, the whole painting morphed and came into perfect perspective. Wow. And uh, he found himself kneeling between St. Jerome and St. Dominic, looking up at Christ, up at Mary, up at this scene, and everything came into perfect perspective. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's such an amazing story. It would be great to have some sort of like model to take away from this that I could practice when I get home. Right. Well, here's what I I've started doing recently and I'm finding it incredibly um, helpful. Uh, it's just a simple four-step model. And to make it easy to remember, it's P-R-A-Y. Perfect. Pause, rejoice, ask, and then yield. And if you're doing this with kids, change yield to just yes, saying okay. yes, yes to God. And, and you don't have to do this. This isn't like steps on a ladder. This is just more like dance steps. This just helps you to, you know, talk, talk with God. But first of all, pause. You know, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. So what that means is, it's a funny thing, but often the best way to start out in prayer is to stop and to be still, to stop kind of talking at God mm. long enough just to focus on the wonder of who he actually is. Psalm 37, verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And I, I just find the world is so hectic. If I just rush into prayer with a bunch of requests and I don't pause, then I, I don't really move into adoration. It's all microscope, not telescope. And, and the way I do that really practically, Poppy, is I'll often just sit quietly, or if I'm walking, I'll just walk quietly for a minute or two and make myself aware that God is present. Mm. If I'm carrying any stress anywhere in my body, I very deliberately just relax in that area. I'll breathe deeply. Um, just what could be more sensible than breathing deeply to just function well. And I'll often use just a little prayer phrase that I just repeat over and over again. It's not so much about the words, it's more about displacing distractions to help me focus. That could be just, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Mm. It could be, thank you, Jesus. It could be praying in, in, in tongues. The, the Franciscans uh, one is, my God and my all, my God and my all. So. Really simply, this is just about, before you rush into anything else in prayer, just be still, breathe deeply, and just maybe repeat a little phrase again and again to help you become aware of the presence of God. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I think I can do that. Um, but tell me what happens when we get distracted. I'm glad you asked that because we all do. I certainly do. The moment I still myself, all sorts of stuff well, everything comes. It comes into yeah. my head exactly you know when that happens the picture I use and this helps me a lot is I just imagine myself in a boat on a lake that's become all serene and and and, and still and then a speedboat comes past and just disrupts everything and it's all hectic that's the distractions but if you just sit still and wait keep doing the breathing thing keep doing the prayer phrase thing everything will become serene again mm. very quickly. So don't panic when distractions come. Just, just stick with it and stay in that place of stillness. Mm, that's such a helpful picture. So we take a few minutes to pause, and then I think you said the next letter stands for rejoice. Right. Rejoicing. This is, you know, adoration. It's hallowing the name of the Father. It's thanksgiving. It's all the stuff we're really looking at in this session. The Apostle Paul just commands us to do this. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So how do we do that? 
like we've, we've been still, it's time to, to rejoice. Well, one of the things that really helps me is just simply reading the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And I'll often do it out loud. They were often meant to be read in that way. I just find it absolutely mind blowing that we have the prayer book of Jesus. Why wouldn't we use that in, in, in worship? And the fact that some of the Psalms are a little bit, um, maybe not the way you would rejoice. I like that because it means that you're stepping into a bigger culture and a bit of bigger story than just yeah. your own you know, hormones and the weather and whatever. And um, also just worship music. I make playlists of you know, different worship music, classical and gospel so and all sorts. Well. And also just to be really simple, I'll sometimes just sit and quietly give thanks to God for his blessings in my life. And sometimes it feels a bit fake, like I'm just doing the right thing, like I'm thanking God for stuff but not really feeling it. Yeah. And I worried about that, but then I thought about that. I thought, well, actually, like with Sammy, if I only ever told her I loved her when I was overwhelmed with emotion, I wouldn't tell her often enough. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's actually a bit more meaningful when... I tell her that I love her when I'm not feeling it and it's just the cold light of day. So don't worry if sometimes rejoicing is a conscious effort, but there will be other times it's just like your heart's just overflowing with, 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 with joy. Yeah. Okay, so I've paused, I've gotten myself centered, I've rejoiced with a psalm or a song, and then now it's time to ask? Yep. So asking, of course, this is when you talk to, you know, the ordinary person about prayer, this is the one they mainly think about. This is asking God for help. And we're going to be looking at that over the next three sessions. We look at mm -hmm. petition, intercession, unanswered prayer. So I'm not going to like, get majorly into that okay. now. And then the final one, why is yield? And that is where we, we pause at the end of a prayer time to listen to God, to invite his Holy Spirit to fill our lives with fresh presence and power. And we surrender our lives. We say, look, you're Lord, I'm not, you're in charge. So this is really important. It's not just bringing our shopping list. And what's great about this model, P-R-A-Y, is it's easy to remember, but also, you know, you can do it in five minutes. You can spend a whole day's retreat working through those stages. You can do it in big prayer meetings. And, and it does work with all ages, including kids. So P-R-A-Y, I find that a really helpful model. So today we really learned that prayer is kind of like climbing into the arms of the Father in adoration, just like your son at the pub. Yeah. And that worship is enjoyable and powerful because it really helps to put things back into the proper perspective, just like the painting that you showed us. Yeah, the, the lippy, yeah. And we've walked through this process here. Yes. P-R-A-Y, pause, rejoice, ask, yield. You don't have to do it, but I, I find it helpful and it just kind of works. Yeah. Well, why don't we pray? Let's do that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, we just, we thank you so much for loving us. And Lord, would you forgive us for the times that, that we've treated you like a slot machine, for the times that we've forgotten to stop and, and to rejoice and to be thankful. I pray this week, God, you would just open our hearts, God, to worship you every day. Lord, teach us to pray.